So I've been getting a lot of questions about uh, brokerage. We get a lot of emails. A lot of people asking about different forms of brokerage. A lot of people asking about the future of brokerage. It seems to be like an omnipresent question in real estate. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? And it seems like everybody likes to be fascinated about these new age tech companies. And uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, some of them are pretty interesting, but all of them sort of revolve around cutting commission. Not really interested too much in cutting commission. That doesn't seem like a new age tech company to me. And the ones that are really doing phenomenal in the marketplace are ones that put agents first, and they don't think of themselves in the real estate business. They think of themselves in the agent business. And if those of you guys who are involved in brokerage, you'll know what I'm talking about. As soon as you shift your mindset and realizing your product is actually the, pro- the profit that your agents produce for themselves and for the brokerage versus I'm in the brokerage business, so I'm also in the real estate business, as soon as you shift that mindset, there's something that's different that happens in your, real, in your brokerage that makes it, frankly, so that, uh, it, Paul? And I think Elite Pacific uh, Realty is probably one of the best examples of that in the country. They have, and I met Margaret through coaching, and they have one of the most, and it's like when I talk to her, it's not like brokerage conversation. It's a conversation about how can I help the agents. And uh, that's such a rare thing. So I'm going to start out by asking a question, and you guys can fight over the mic and whoever's going to answer it. But how did you decide, well, since Paul's got the mic, how did you decide when putting the brokerage together, where did that mindset of realizing that the agent is the product? Because you've said that, we've had that conversation. Where, where, where did that come from? That's not a normal thought. It is our customer. Um, as a brokerage, I guess it may have come from the fact that I'm actually not a licensed realtor. So I'm an entrepreneur, and I have been my whole life, and so when I started the brokerage business, I didn't think like a realtor, I thought like a business. And who's the customer of a brokerage? Well, it's still the agents. They're the ones that sell the real estate and make all the money. I wanted to start a, a brokerage in which I didn't make money off my agents, I made money with my agents. The only way I could succeed is that the agents succeeded. And so I took that philosophy and married it with my knowledge of other businesses and created a just a differently structured brokerage business. Instead of the agents being out there as kind of general purpose, jack of all trades, trying to do everything, be a graphic artist, be a database administrator, be a content writer, all that sort of thing, created a company with centralized support that took all the administrative possible tasks away from the agents so they could focus on what they do best for itself. Most agents are really good at working with people, at knowing the market, at being salespeople, but they're not necessarily good at marketing and technology and administrative tasks. So we, from the very beginning, we started the company with literally one newly licensed agent, my, my business partner, Seth in Cyprus. And at, with that one agent, we also had centralized marketing and transaction management so that he didn't have to worry about that. We just kept growing the company with that same philosophy in mind ever since. Well, but so what's interesting is you've also, you, you guys have also built a really desirable luxury brand. And brand is a word that people way overuse and no one really knows the hell it means. But in Hawaii, when you reach a certain level of success, you want to become an elite agent. And when you guys, and when Margaret goes out and she recruits agents, they're not, they're, they're all, at the nature of the relationship that you're having with, uh, the, com- the conversation you're having with the agent is completely different because it's not the, a- it's not the agent in the, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go to your brokerage or another one. It's like, can I please be an elite agent? How did you create that? So, uh, again, business strategy from the beginning was to make the company the most desirable place for an agent to work. So it was all about providing the brand, the culture, technology, support systems to make them successful, which attracts the agents. And we frankly gave them a great deal so that we could attract the best agents be very selective. When you are selective, when you create that all-star team, when you have only the best, then the best want to join you. So we just attracted people. And when Margaret has those conversations, uh, which really aren't even recruiting, they mm-hmm. want to join the lead, and she's interviewing them, the subject of commission split rarely comes up. If it does come up, it's at the very end. It's all about whether it's a good fit and what services we provide and how we help make, make agents successful because that's our mission is to make every agent successful. And commission doesn't really matter when that's what you're doing. Well, by extension, by extension, everything we do for the agent, they're actually doing for the client, right? So if we're making um, that, them that much more successful and proficient, and better at what they're doing, then they're able to support and serve their client that much better too. 
and they have more time, more energy, and they can do it in a much more professional manner and provide the concierge level service that you know we want as a company. Elite does something that I I can't even think of another brokerage doing. It's so rare that Elite will say you're not a good fit for us and we don't want you to be part of our brokerage. I mean that's something that you never hear about. We do that all the time on the way in. I would say that we turn down far more agents than we accept. We're only looking for you know the normal full full time professional career oriented agents, but also those who have great performance for the clients and great uh, service to their clients. It also has to be a cultural fit. So we have, have a, as a company we have a success culture. You have to want to learn, grow, be better, be the best you can be. We're not a place for agents to kind of cruise and relax and just half measure. So if you're not that kind of a person, you're not going to be a good fit with the lead. And then we're also a very team-oriented uh, culture and not the sort of real estate team, but in that everybody helps. It's more of a, it's like a community. It's a statewide company. We're on four different islands in Hawaii, and everybody likes each other, helps each other. They'll help each other stage and price and do showings and give their best ideas. It's not a competitive situation. So when, when there are agents that may be top producers and they're interested, they may not be a fit for us by terms of culture. Um, and then we also have standards to stay at Elite. And so Margaret has a fun job every quarter of inviting some agents to leave the company. And these are agents that are, frankly, profitable for us. Sometimes they're very solid producers, and there's some uh, culture issues or performance issues, not in sales, but in other elements, service, ways they interact with uh, other members of the team or the real estate community that are not acceptable for us. And then there's also performance. So we require a minimum of $3 million a year in production. So if we look back every quarter, have they met that standard? And unless there's extenuating circumstances, Margaret has to explain to them why that's not a good fit for a lead. They might want to join our sister referral firm, or they might want to join another brokerage firm, or they might think they should get out of the business because they're not making a living at it. It's not good for them. Well, that's, again, putting agents first, and that's being honest with them. It's not just the typical body shop model that's been around since the 70s. Yeah, we're, um, we believe strongly that agents want to be with the best. And so even if an agent is profitable, they're kind of bringing us down if they're at the bottom of that tier. So she goes through the top grading uh, process all the time. And you're, you're removing the bottom, you're bringing in the good ones at the top, and that just raises the, the quality overall of the team. One of the things that we started doing, in fact, Tim will tell you, is making sure that our agents are best in class. Because as we were talking about the possible recessions coming up, best in class always survives. And um, in fact, we've had gr great focus on listings and being a listing agent. And you know, Tim and Julie have really helped a lot as far as preparing our agents. You know, a lot of people are afraid to be listing agents for all the reasons we know. But um, you know, we really spend a lot of time with our agents trying to develop them to be the best they can be for, you know, for the future. Well, you know, I'm going to give you guys a compliment because I, we literally get blackballed from brokerages because they don't want us saying what we say. They don't want us telling people, agents, because of what Brandon said. Because they're worried about the agents aren't going to be able to handle it. And that's your philosophy. That's not an agent. I'm in the agent business philosophy. That's in the not you're not thinking about what's best for the agent when you take that approach. And so that's some. I would give you guys. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest reasons people are attracted to you. That it's getting feedback. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest reasons, and that's the reason you guys have become the number one, one of the many real estate brokerage, number one luxury real estate. You have the highest sale price, not by a little, but by a lot, and an incredibly competitive international market. It is very, very competitive, and we're, we continue to gain market share. We're, we've grown very fast. 2017, uh, sales were up 58% over 2016. This year, they're up 29% over last year. In a market that is slowing the, at the high end, which is what we focus on, and so the luxury market is, is slowing a little bit in, in Hawaii also. Um, I was going to give you a, a compliment to one of our agents that, um, that has listened to you. 
She had a little business going where she was spending a lot on advertising. She had two assistants. She was doing big top line numbers. And what she wasn't making a lot of profit. And so she decided, you know what? I'm going to cut back. I'm going to spend less money on all that marketing and less on assistance, and I'll make more profit. And I think that was the right advice. We try to give our agents that. Well, it's because if your agents have financial stability themselves, if the storm clouds do brew, or in your case, the volcano, right? Which is, I mean, is an omnipresent problem. It seems that damn thing's not going away. But I understand it is creating a lot more new real estate for you guys. Uh, not really Quite literally, real estate. not no, not really, not very valuable. That's been a little bit of an external factor for us on uh, on the Big Island for sure. Actually, where Margaret lives, the the, uh, the Kona area, even though it's not close to the volcano, it's very much impacted. Uh, we also have a vacation home business, and so it's been impacted as well. And the, the, the national media has not helped us because they don't really differentiate. They don't show that the volcanoes in one tiny little part of one island have nothing to do with the rest of the, the state. Uh, they, they just say, Hawaii, volcano, people are fleeing, houses destroyed. So that's not been helpful for us. That's true. And I'll, if, I, if you don't mind, can, for all the people listening on that little Mevo camera there, right? is it okay that we invite them to attend the event in November? December? December? Sorry, you gave me a look. I was like, no, you're like, did it get moved? <laughs> right, so we're going to be in uh, Hawaii in December. So if you guys would like to attend, there'll be, I'm sure we'll create some way for you to attend. And for those of you who are watching online, then same offer extended to you as well. Taxi got people to Hawaii. Yeah, that doesn't suck. <laughs> Which island? It's on Oahu. It's a, it's a Friday. December 14th. 14th all day event with Tim and Julie. All day? Well, I, we live like an hour. Oh, oh, okay. Hey, you know what, Julie? We'll save the afternoon notes for that. <laughs> and then, um, after that, you can you know, spend the weekend and Christmas shop and then everything. Something I also wanted to add uh, when Paul was talking about our agents is our average agent is up 24% year over year. Yeah. And they've been, you've had very consistent growth, too. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting when we have one of your coaching, when one of your agents become a coaching clients and you talk to them, they don't have their minds going with all the other clutter about things they have to do because you guys are doing them for them. And so a lot of people talk about full service brokerage, but you literally have a full service brokerage where they just have to focus on listing and working with buyers and they don't have to, now some of them I'm sure trapes off and try to do their own things or whatever, but the elite brand has become elite in Hawaii to the extent that they, that's been a huge advantage to them and they don't have to worry about all those other ancillary things and can focus on what's best for the clients. Again, people say this, but how many people have actually done it in the country? Not very many. We also have a really large focus on personal improvement. In fact, um, that's why there are people at Elite who are listening to uh, Tim and Julie's podcast all the time and you know doing things like the Miracle Morning. And, um, that's a big focus for us. It's not only just what their business life is like, but what their personal life is like, and you know, uh, improving the person while we're improving their business for them. Great. Any questions, guys? No questions, Brandon, Mr. Big Broker? Oh, qu oh, I know you had a question, of course. All right, so do we have somebody who's going to be carrying around mics? Oh, no, Tom had to go do an errand. I guess we're going to recruit. Uh, oh, camera guy. I'm guessing camera guy probably is, like, seriously skilled at it. Uh, Mike behind me. Is this the one that was giving feedback, Tim? Well... I like how everyone has been forced to become an AV specialist. So uh, I think we had a question. Yeah. In Las Vegas, in our, in our market, we have a problem with agents and sometimes the way they present themselves. We have anything from millennials that look like they're homeless to we have uh, former strippers who come in still with kind of topless and you can see through. Honestly, we have. Oh, no, we live there. That, that's for yeah, real. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an issue. So my question is, do you have? And I don't have a cell phone over here, so it's not that. Do you have a dress code? Oh. How do you deal with that? Because I I'm just appalled at what some so people we, think we of. Venture. We do not have a dress code per se, and in fact, uh, my time is a little more casual than Hawaii. 
we have one very successful agent who works in a beach town and he wears shorts and a t-shirt to show his multi, multi-millionaire clients around to buy their beach property and it works for him. Uh, nobody, literally nobody wears a jacket or a tie. It's pretty rare to wear a dress shirt or dress pants. So you've got to dress appropriately for the market Tim, and who your clients You hold the are. mic. And in you hold the mic. Don't give it to him. So, they're going to wear clean, respectable clothing. We don't, uh, we don't uh, allow in the company people who address the way you've described, so we don't have that issue. But we've got professionals that know what to do and know how to present. Pre-qualifying agents is what I'm hearing him say. Could you talk a little bit more about your event? Oh, talk about the event. Sorry, sorry about that. So the event is <clears throat> with uh, all the elite agents. They'll come in from the outer islands and attend on Oahu as well as the Oahu agents. And um, basically, uh, Tim and Julie will do a little bit of what we've done, what we've seen today. But it's going to be more aimed at probably you know a, a more of a day to day sort of as opposed to the higher level uh, agent. Um, education that we've received today. Um, likely there will be something on listings because that's one of my big focuses and I'm always bugging Tim to help me with that. So I, um, you know, it'll be a, a nice a nice event. I'm not sure, we haven't set the ticket price yet. It, uh, although Tim did tell me that he saved some of his Harris rules Books for, for us because no, Julie bought a new car, so that's out. Oh, that's out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, but oh, no, the books, yes, we'll bring books. some books, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you'll, you'll just stay tuned. Uh, Tim and Julie will probably be sending it out on their, under their heading. Yeah, definitely. Whole crew. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Jo- uh, John. We'll, we'll keep John, he's going to hold the mic. Okay. With full service, I'll get a little further away. With full service, so tell me the agent takes the listing, they hand it in, and then they don't do anything more with it? Or what happened? Well, there's 53 steps that our marketing department does to put a, um, a property on the market. Everything from you know all of the social media sites to we have a program that we subscribe to called Brivity that answers the question that the seller always wants to know: What have you done for me lately? And you know it's, it extends on to you know when you have showings, when somebody calls you on the property, and so on and so forth. So uh, to uh, creating of a brochure, they upload the photos and the text. And then a very professional brochure is uh, created for them. We only allow professional photography, uh, nothing else. And then but you guys do it all. We do it all. And then within you know, three to four days of them uploading the photos, you know, they'll appear at their mailing address, whatever they... You know, on, on go, go, go to their website and look at the media that they create. Look at the pictures on their website. Your website is... Just look at it. You've never seen a website with pictures like that ever. It's so, crazy. So what did the agents do? What did you, list the house. They list the house. They, yeah. they, they also ported the photographer. They pay for the photographer like normally. Um, we also have a pretty huge representation. You're probably all familiar with Luxury Home Magazine. I think it's kind of nationwide. So uh, that's the um, uh, magazine that, that we're involved in. So, and it's uh, obviously a great piece for listings. Sellers love to see that. It's a coffee table book. So we do support that magazine. And we underwrite that for our agents. So basically, an agent can go in and get one whole page. And we have a negotiated rate and a special uh, spread, unlike the other um, Companies in there, it's much more vibrant, much more photo oriented because you know it's all about the photos. And uh, for the first page, and the, the uh, magazine comes out six times a year, every two months, for one page, Elite pays for half of it. So um, for 
list any listing, they get a one page, really nice quality brochure. We'll send out as many postcards as they want uh, on just about anything. We, all, we only ask them for just uh, postage, the cost of postage and the cost of, cost of printing. So we help them with their farming uh, for um, properties that are two, two million up. We provide a really nice four page uh, brochure, and those are also available for the uh, lower end properties, which we do also have lower end properties. Our average selling price is about 800,000. Uh, so we have properties, actually, believe it or not, that go from, you know, for 30,000 all the way up to 30 million uh, in the state. So, because we, not that we really want our agents selling $30,000 properties, but sometimes it's a business decision. And they have to sell that or represent that client because that client, there's other reasons. Law of view. Yeah, those are usually in the law of view. <laughs> Any other questions? So let, let me add a little bit more to the what do we do and what do the agents have to do. So um, the marketing that Margaret was talking about, it's a, we have a nine person marketing department that does all of that property and personal marketing for the agents so that once they get the listing and supply the description of the photo, we take over all the things that Margaret talked about. That's a huge time saver. The other really meaningful time saver is transaction management. So we also have a nine person transaction management team. So once they have a signed contract, the transaction manager takes over from there and basically gets it all the way through to closing. So all the hundreds of emails and phone calls and signatures and timelines and all that kind of stuff, we take care of all that for them. Coaching and training department that's putting out training materials all the time and does some internal coaching as well. Uh, administrative help, so like getting their uh, contacts into their, the CRM, we provide them with all of their subscriptions, all their technology subscriptions. They don't have to figure out what's the best CRM or what's the market trend reporting system and all because we take care of all of that and all the integrations for them. So basically, <coughs> anything that can be done centrally, we do centrally, so the agent can stay focused on sales. Good. Brandon, are they paying? Are you? Are they paying for that? Is it in? Is it in the split? Is there a transaction fee? Like he runs how, a big brokerage. You want to be profitable, I'm sure. You need to be. Well, we only learned that brokerage means you get broker. Right. right. So the other part is that you age. I think those are the two parts of brokerage. Is you get brokerage. You got it. So um, yeah, it is a struggle to get reasonable levels of profitability out of the brokerage business, and uh, frankly, I think it's just going to continue to get worse. Um, Agent splits have gotten higher and higher historically over time. They've gone, from over the last 20 years, they've gone from an average of 30% uh, company retained dollar to 15%, which means that your operating costs have to shrink accordingly. So our goal is to get to 5% uh, net margins over the long term. Do you guys hear what he just said? What did he just say? Repeat what he just said. It's important you understand that. Well, profit from the brokerage at their level is 5%. By the way, we hope to get it to. We're not there yet. right. And by the way, the national average is less than 3% for brokerage. And brokerage is a low margin business. You've got to be very efficient. And to your point, we provide all of these services for free, which is very expensive. And we don't get a high split either. So it is a, just a fantastic deal for the agents. And the reason we do that is so that we can attract the best agents. <coughs> and then we use that brokerage business to drive higher margin ancillary businesses. Uh, so for example, we have a very substantial driving vacation rental business, which makes sense for Hawaii, right? A lot of vacation rentals. And most of those luxury homes that we represent when our clients buy them, they want to vacation rent them. So we can manage that as a trusted partner for them. And vacation is a much higher margin business. We also have a long-term property management business. Again, higher margin business. So we use this very high volume brokerage, very high volume of low margin brokerage business to drive these other two higher margin businesses. And that's our business strategy to survive. And I don't think it's going to get easier on the brokerage side because of these different business models that are out there. And they're, you know, we'll see how they do. My personal belief is that um, they're going to continue to take market share slowly. It's not like tomorrow, suddenly everybody's going to be using Redfin. That's not going to happen, but little by little, they're going to keep on encroaching. And that's going to keep on reducing the, the commission price 
that the client is willing to pay because they have these alternatives. And it, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to use it, but when you have competition, it does impact pricing. So I think that uh, listing commissions will continue to get squeezed just as they have from six nationally down to in the low fives nationally now. And the commissions that you have to pay to agents will keep getting higher over time. And so from a brokerage standpoint, that's not a good combination of factors right there. So you have to keep on being more and more efficient and making money on ancillary businesses. And focusing on recruiting agents that are actually going to be very efficient at selling houses and listing agents. So yeah. we could do what we do if our average selling price was $250,000. You can only do it if you know our average selling price is $800,000. So that does help us. That's an important point. All right, Louis, yeah, go ahead. One more question, and then he's going to hold it, Louis. Uh, are, are these things that you're, you're implementing, are they system, systematized where you could sell them to somebody else or somebody come to you and say, hey, I need this kind of marketing. I need these 53 steps. Can I pay you to market for me kind of thing, number one. And number two, are you branding your company or are you branding the agent to where if they leave, they're taking all that marketing that you did for them kind of thing? Those are interesting questions. So could we do these for other agents? We absolutely could, but we wouldn't want to. Now, that is our, one of our strategic competitive advantages that attracts agents to us. If we did it for other people, then they'd be less likely to join us and we'd be in an even worse business than we're in right now of doing services for agents. Um, we do allow our agents to brand themselves. We encourage that. One of the very first things, we have a very structured onboarding process. And the very first thing we have them do is go get their own domain name that they can brand themselves, have their own domain, and that will point to the website that we provide for them or to their own website. We don't care. We want them to own it. Again, the bigger the agent business, we're doing what's right for them. So we let them, if they want to come up with a, a team name, that's fine. If they want to come up with their own little branding, that's fine. By state law, they have to use the Elite Pacific name and logo. And of course, we require that from our branding standards as well. One of the hidden benefits of providing all of the marketing for our agents is that it ensures that it's all done consistently high quality to our center. So every brochure from the Leap Pacific Properties listing looks the same. They're all laid out the same way, all formatted the same way. Every email looks the same and so forth. So I, I don't know that there's any marketing to take. They could keep that format if they left us, but luckily the agents don't leave our company. So we don't Unless have asked to. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you rarely see them again. Yeah, well, they're usually not, yeah. All right, uh, yes. Uh, we have, wait for the mic, please, ma'am. What is the most important um, feature when marketing like luxury properties and like the characteristics of the consumers that you work with in the luxury market? Sorry, most important. You mean what's the most important, what do you think, can you reframe that? Yeah, so I don't work with a ton of luxury properties. I I work with some, but not a lot. So what is the demographic for you guys, like the characteristics of the consumer that you guys work with? What does that look like for you and what appeals to them with working at Pacific Elite and why would they pick your company over the competition with how you guys do things. From the seller's perspective or from, from a the seller's agent? perspective. Okay, got it. Why would the seller hire want to work with Elite? Okay. Yes. Well, one of the main things is service. Uh, the level of service, as I mentioned, because we do so much for our agents, they're able to extend that same quality to their clients. Um, also, we've created a unbelievable reach uh, statewide. I mean, you see Elite signs now all over the place. So they know that we have the strength. We're also, now I have to say, we probably, in many markets, I would say we're best in class. So people that want luxury and they want good service and they want the best, they're gonna pick the best in class. You know, and, and it's something that, you know, you have to fight to stay in that position. You can't expect that you're gonna be the front of the magazine forever so it's something that we're constantly working on um, I often say that uh, um, Paul's the brains of the organization and I'm the heart of the organization not that he doesn't have any heart and I don't have any brains but he, he spends so much time always looking for 
what is a better way to do this, and what is a better process for this, and what a, what's a better platform, and you know, so we're always constantly looking for the best way to do a CMA or to create something for the seller. You know, we're constantly looking for the very best, and then he'll take and he'll find that, and he'll get with the uh, manufacturer or the producer of it, and then customize it over and over on top of that until it, until it you know, meets elite standards. You just said the important word standards. So we have very high standards in everything that we do, and that's the agents that we select and the properties that we list and the way we do our marketing, the way we support our agents, and that is an important part of the uh, attracting a luxury clientele is having those high standards, high consistent standards. So, like Margaret said, only professional photography for, for everything. So that even includes if there's a $100,000 condo, it's professional photography because you don't know who's going to see it. So anything that touches the consumer must be very high quality. Specialization is also very important. So we knew from the start when uh, we started the business, it was to be a luxury brokerage. So for the first year, we literally didn't accept any listing under a million dollars so that we could establish that brand impression, that positioning in the marketplace. You can't be all things to all people. You have to specialize. And then the final thing I'd say is that the, uh, the luxury client wants to work with an agent that they can view as a peer, a social peer, an intellectual peer. They have to be able to communicate on that level. That's the biggest barrier to entry for most agents that want to work luxury. They may not be able to because they may not be able to communicate with that client as a peer. They're just not going to be accepted, therefore, as, as somebody that was. That is something I never heard actually someone be that honest about, and that is the truth. Yeah. Right. I really appreciate you guys coming today and flying that long flight. And thank you for having us out in December. Thank you.